guessing that if you watch my channel, and if you clicked on this video, that you've probably heard the term biogeochemistry. But what does biogeochemistry mean? What is biogeochemistry? Well, in this video, I'm going to be answering exactly that question. Now, don't be afraid or scared off of this video just because it's a big, scary word. It's very simple. And actually, biogeochemistry and biogeochemical cycles, which I'll explain later, are incredibly fundamental concepts. I don't think just for scientists, but for everybody. Because, well, you know what? I'm just going to tell you what it is and you'll see why. It's so important to understand. And not just important, but like really cool because you get to kind of learn how Earth works and how all of its systems are connected, which I find incredibly fascinating. Before we jump right into the video, allow me to thank the sponsor of today's video, Brilliant. Brilliant is an amazing online learning platform with thousands of really fun and interactive courses that I will talk about more at the end of the video, as well as give you guys a special offer just for my audience. So stick around to the end to hear more about Brilliant and the offer I have for you guys. So what is biogeochemistry? To answer this question, I feel like we have to start breaking down the word. First, what is geochemistry? Well, geology and chemistry combined make geochemistry, meaning it's the study of the distribution and cycling of chemical elements in Earth's crust and interior. So basically everything having to do with the chemistry of Earth's crust through time and spatial distribution and geochemists investigate the chemical composition and behavior of elements and compounds in rocks, minerals, soils, water, and the atmosphere, basically any system on Earth. However, if we look at Earth as a system, as opposed to basically any other planet in our solar system, there's one component that really affects geochemistry, and that is, well, bio. <laughs> Biogeochemistry adds a biological or life component onto this field. So biogeochemistry is the study of interactions between the biosphere, life, the atmosphere, air, the hydrosphere, water, and cryosphere, ice, and the geosphere, rocks. And this is really important because Earth's biological, geological, and chemical processes are strongly interconnected. When people study biology or chemistry or geology in, you know, natural systems, it's nearly impossible to study just that ology in isolation because there's some other component or ology that's also playing a role. Like when I try and study the geology of sediments at the bottom of the ocean, which was a large component of my PhD work, that is heavily affected by the ocean's chemistry and the ocean's life content, the biology around. And that's why it turns into the study of biogeochemistry without me even trying because it has to. You have to take into account those other components that are affecting the composition of that marine sediment. Yet I still get asked sometimes, how can life really heavily affect the globe? How can any one species or multiple species induce global chemical or climate or environmental change? This is often a question directed at how can humans, one species on Earth, produce such a large effect that it causes global change. It just doesn't seem like one species could affect the entire planet. But there's actually many examples throughout Earth's history in which life has greatly affected global environments and climates on Earth. For example, we humans breathe in oxygen to live on Earth today. And this molecular oxygen makes up 21% of our modern Earth atmosphere. This relatively huge amount of oxygen in our atmosphere greatly affects the composition of Earth's oceans, lakes, and rocks. It also heavily affects the chemical processes that occur at Earth's surface. For example, how organic matter burns, in other words, fire, how fire forms, how much sunlight gets through our atmosphere. Ozone was formed when oxygen started building up in the atmosphere. And the blocking of certain UV rays by ozone is what allows so much of Earth's life to live today. 
However, this was not always the case. Oxygen has not been present in Earth's atmosphere for the entirety of Earth's history. It actually wasn't until photosynthesizing life came along that oxygen became quite abundant in Earth's atmosphere. This photosynthetic life that evolved around 3.5 to 3 billion years ago began producing oxygen until it built up enough to cause what we call the Great Oxidation Event, which at the time to a lot of the anaerobic life that was on Earth was detrimental, it caused a major mass extinction. However, it then allowed oxygen breathing life to evolve and become larger. I talk about why oxygen breathing life is able to be larger and multicellular and more complex in my How Life Got Huge video, I think, and I'll link that up to the top right for you. But if life had not evolved the ability to produce oxygen in this way, Earth's atmosphere would have likely remained much more CO2 rich and oxygen depleted. Ozone would not have formed and life would have had to remain relatively extremophile life. In other words, life that lives in what we deem as extreme conditions today. And these organisms are typically microbial. So life would have probably remained microscopic if oxygenic or oxygen producing photosynthesis had not evolved, which is crazy. So this is just one example of how life greatly affects the geochemistry of Earth, the global climatic and environmental conditions of Earth. Okay, okay, so this was one time, but another example of the importance of bio in biogeochemistry is where we get our resources, where we currently get most of our energy. To produce energy, we burn or oxidize organic carbon deposits in Earth's crust, which we often call fossil fuels. And there's a reason we call them fossil fuels. Fossil fuel deposits, although there's a lot of jokes about them being like dinosaur bones, actually come predominantly from ancient algal, bacterial, and plant deposits that either built up in marine or kind of terrestrial swampy systems to form these huge organic matter deposits, basically containing the organic carbon from their dead bodies. And over millions of years in the rock record, this organic carbon became fossil fuel deposits like coal, oil, natural gas that we use today to produce energy. And a third example of the bio and biogeochemistry being super important is soil. Do you ever think about what soil's made of? Because it's not just dirt. It is not just inorganic rock, sand, silt, and clay. Sand, silt, and clay make up the rock portion. And then there's a huge water portion. And I think I have like a pie chart of what's contained in soil somewhere in one of my soil videos. But the rest of soil is in different amounts, depending on how deep you go, organic matter, organic carbon from plant debris, bacteria, and microorganisms. Soil is incredibly important to us as it filters groundwater, allowing us to have fresh water to use and drink. It sequesters and stores carbon, controlling atmospheric carbon levels. I've talked a lot about that in my um, carbon sequestration video, which I'll link up to the top right. And it stores nutrients for plants, especially the top humus layer that the microbial degradation of plant matter maintains. This layer is really rich in nutrients that the kind of microbes and organic matter that they produce by the decomposition of plant litter, uh, they basically store it there in that layer for plants to then use, which we then gain by eating plants and things that eat the plants, which is another reason why pesticides and herbicides and over fertilizing is not great because then all the microbes that make and store these wonderful nutrients for plants and us get killed and then over fertilizing on top of that leads to the plant relying on that over abundance of nutrients which then causes us to just pour more on because you know we've killed all the microbes that <laughs> give them nutrients so it's the cycle of just worsening plant health and nutrient levels and it's not great so we should really focus on increasing our microbial awareness and microbial health of our soils in any case soil like oxygen in our atmosphere has not always been around on earth obviously early on earth before land plants had evolved 
Soil wasn't a thing. It wasn't until microbes, fungi, and plants spread on land and began breaking up that solid rock into smaller and smaller fragments until soil formed. This occurred around 450 to 400 million years ago, and this formation of soil actually so heavily affected continental weathering rates, in other words, the rates of weathering down of the earth rock and transport of their ions to the ocean, which formed more rock, it so heavily increased the rate of weathering that it led to a global glaciation, or in part led to a global cooling and glaciation event, because increases in the rate of continental weathering cause increases in the rate of carbon burial. When those ions get transported to the ocean, they then precipitate out as either calcium carbonate, or they go act as nutrients to algal blooms, which then cause the burial of carbon um, through their dead bodies, again, like we talked about earlier, Earlier. And so all this carbon burial leads to a decrease in atmospheric carbon and therefore cooling because atmospheric carbon is greenhouse gas, so decreasing it cools. I talk about that in a lot of my other videos, but that has happened a couple times in Earth's history in which plants have spread on land, first with non-vascular plants like mosses and the Ordovician, and then with vascular plants like big trees and forests and the Devonian, which caused major global cooling and glaciation events, which in part led to the major mass extinctions at the end of the Ordovician and Devonian periods. Anyway, I talk about that in other videos too. But how cool is it that life itself on Earth has so heavily affected Earth's global climate in the past and on modern Earth? Not only that, but life also, in a way, makes life possible on modern Earth. If you look at, like, any living system, you know, we talk about the marine food chain or any other, you know, food chain or reef system or whatever it might be, ecosystems, you know, they're all so interconnected and we all rely on each other. And in this way, you can see that the bio in the biogeochemistry is not only important for the geochemistry, but also for bio itself. It's just incredible how intertwined these systems are within each sphere, biosphere, geosphere, etc., but also for the other spheres. <laughs> And like I mentioned earlier, some people say, no, no way humans have such a major effect on global climate. We are just one species on this huge planet, way bigger than us. But like I just showed in just a few examples, life on Earth has caused global climate change and mass extinctions over and over throughout geologic time. And while we aren't the first species to cause global change, we might be the first with the ability to identify our effect and mitigate the impact of this change. I don't know why we're so focused on the debate of whether we caused it or not. It doesn't matter. The fact is we can fix it. We can do something because we know what's happening and we know many methods in which we can sequester and store carbon to mitigate these effects. I mean, it's like if the dinosaurs knew that the asteroid was coming and knew how to stop it, they probably would would have, you know? It's like, we just have to do it. And studying biogeochemistry is one way to do this. It improves our understanding of nutrient cycling, ecosystem health, and climate change progression, and allows us to, one, identify our influence on climate change and distinguish it from other natural fluctuations and perturbations in our carbon cycle and climate. And once we identify our impact, we can work to mitigate the harmful effects. And so that is biogeochemistry, what it is and why it's so important. But what are biogeochemical cycles? You've probably, if you've heard the term biogeochemistry, heard it in the context of cycling of certain elements throughout Earth's different systems. So what does this mean? Biogeochemical cycles, again, sounds like a long, big term that's scary and hard to understand, but it's very simple. It's just the cycling or transfer of essential elements between Earth's life, atmosphere, water bodies, and crust. In other words, the biosphere, atmosphere, hydrosphere, and geosphere again. This transfer and cycling of essential elements for life on Earth through these different systems maintains global nutrient balance and sustains life on Earth. But what are the 
biogeochemical cycles. You've probably also heard a the put in front of it. So if there are some specific cycles that are commonly talked about, what are they? Well, I'm glad you ask. They're the Chinops elements. I've talked a lot about the Chinops elements in my videos and sometimes I'll get comments like, what's Chinops? And I'm like, oh gosh, did I not define it? Chinops includes carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur elements, which are bioessential, essential for life, elements that cycle, you know, through these different systems because they're essential for life. Obviously, the ones that aren't would more so be geochemical cycles than biogeochemical cycles, but these elements are the essential for all life on Earth elements that we really want to track in order to understand nutrient cycling, ecosystem health, and all of that. There are some other elements that are also really important for life, but not as important as the Chinops elements, so they're not included in the name, but these include things like iron, manganese, and other trace metals that life needs, just not in such large amounts. These Chinops elements move through chemical reservoirs, the atmosphere, air, hydrosphere, oceans and lakes, cryosphere, glaciers and ice, biosphere, life, and geosphere, rocks and soil. So if you want to hear more about biogeochemical cycles and the specific Chinops element cycles one at a time and how each one works and the factors that drive those cycles and what kinds of things might perturb or alter the cycles in a way that might cause a mass extinction, you can check out my next video, which may or may not be out by now, by the time you're watching this, should be the following week after this one. That one will be all about these specific biogeochemical cycles. But before you leave this video, if you enjoyed learning about biogeochemistry and how all of these scientific fields kind of fit together and are interconnected and are almost impossible to study without each other, I highly recommend you check out Brilliant. Brilliant, like I mentioned earlier, has tons of amazing online courses where you can learn just how strongly connected these scientific fields are. I don't think they even really promote that about their courses and their website, but I realized through doing more brilliant courses that it really does give you a great understanding of how different science fields, physics, math, chemistry, statistics, geology are connected and work together and how you need a lot of those, you know, together to do one of them, you know, like you can't do it in isolation. And that's one of the things I love about Brilliant, among many other things. For example, just how fun and interactive their courses are. I mean, you can toggle around things and play with things and really learn a lot on their platform. And I wish I could make my videos more interactive, but I unfortunately can't do any interactive things with you guys, so the best I can do is give you an amazing offer just for you guys in my audience in which you can get 20% off an annual premium Brilliant subscription. That is 20% off with the link below in my description and pinned comment, brilliant.org slash geogirl. And if you don't want to commit right away, you can get 30 free days premium Brilliant if you click the link down below. So I hope you guys will now go check out Brilliant and do a couple lessons and then come back to watch my biogeochemical cycles video next week. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you guys next time. Bye!